scripture. Oh. <laughs> the scripture I'm about to read is in Ephesians, it's chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. Okay. It says, Therefore, having put away falsehoods, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Thank you, Tim. Oh, lots of exciting stuff going on. I got some of Tim's microphone. <laughs> um, just so you know, Bible Bowl is coming up. I think we heard about that. Brad said he could still use your house. So if you're willing to let him know that you're okay with having a few kids, like 20, <laughs> just... Go ahead and let him know that. If you don't want 20, you better tell him now that you only want two, okay? So, you know, otherwise he'll go ahead and assign you the 20. Hopefully that way everybody will go talk to Brad and say, no, no, just two. <laughs> but uh, we are short a few houses and we've got about 65 kids coming in. And uh, so we need a few more places for people to stay. Hopefully you filled out the survey already. There's a note in your bulletin, a link to where it is. Go fill it out online or else there's papers at the back. We just kind of want your feedback, your input for what's going on here and just what you feel uh, is good, what you see needs improvement and just all of those things. Um, also, next Sunday will be new classes. And so we're trying this two-month thing. We'll see how it works. We'll have a complete schedule for you next Sunday. Ashby will still be in here. Joshua will still have his class. But I just wanted you to know that C.R. Gaines is going to be in room 105 talking about hidden in Christ. And so if you'd like a different class or like to listen to him, 105 is going to be a good place. Uh, come next week and uh, be able to share in some of the Bible classes and the great teachers that we have and the way that we study here. I think that's it. I told you, lots of things going on. So um, we just want you to be involved. We want you to be here and want you to be able to do things. So we're talking a lot about honesty today, honesty in everything. Uh, the specific command from Exodus comes out of Exodus 20 and verse 15, you shall not steal. Seems like a pretty simple command, don't steal. Everybody got that? Let's stand and sing. <laughs> uh, okay, maybe a couple more things. What does he mean by this? Because he's been talking about all these different things, about what it means to be able to have one God, what it means to be able to worship him. And, and he's talked about family. He's talked about what's holy. He's talked about violence. He's talked about morality. And so all of these things he's talking about as basic core things. Your honesty as a person is a basic core thing. What is it that you do? How is it that you are honest? How can people trust you? Can they trust you? Is there a whole lot of people that have trouble with that? And they're like, well, I'm not sure you're going to do what you say. And so they may question your honesty. How do we build that up once we are just starting out or once we've lost it? How do you build up honesty or trust? And I think it's just by being a person who's trustable, being a person who's always honest and being able to understand what that's all about. The passage in Ephesians that uh, was just read to us by Tim talks about many things. 
He talks about anger, he talks about stealing, he talks about lying, and he talks about this honesty. I mean, these all seem to go together. And in most of the passages that you're going to run into, when he talks about one, he talks about the other. Because a lot of times it comes out of this anger situation. And the times when we might steal or when we might say the wrong thing is going to be because of anger. And so here he says, I want you to put away falsehood. I want you to always speak the truth. That helps. We'll talk more about that next week. Be angry, but don't sin. And so don't let the devil get in. Don't let, uh, there's going to be times when you're just angry. But don't let that cause a problem for you. Don't let anger make you lose control. Don't let anger be something that allows things to come out of you that you didn't know were in you in the first place. And so he says, don't let any corrupting talk. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. And so it's not a matter of allowing this to take over and to be able to be part of our life. But I think this is what comes in sometimes, and it's all the people around us, isn't it? I mean, it's never us. It's all those other people around us. And if they were just nicer to us and they treated us with the respect we deserve, then everything would be fine. However, they don't seem to do that all the time. It seems like we're always having to fight for things. This is mine. This is what I want. Why are you trying to take it from me? And so we enter into those things ever since the time we were little. You watch two siblings. We have two new grandchildren. Uh, True, it was fine. Has all the toys, no problem. Until a little sister comes along. And she walks over and walks, crawls over, rolls over, and starts playing with one of his. And no, that's mine and tries to take it away, tries to get it away from her. That's mine. And so she, he has to have that. And what she does is go to the next one. No, that one's mine. And it just happens over and over again that way. We've got to protect what's ours because after all, those people out there trying to steal it and take it. And even if we weren't even using it, we have to protect it. Why do we get that way? Maybe we need to look at what honesty really is and what it's all about. And he says, let this anger be put away from you. Be tenderhearted, forgiving, the same way you were forgiven. Maybe a little bit of sharing that goes on there. And then he comes to the thief. And he says, let the thief steal no longer. Let him do honest work with his own hands so he can share with those in need. It's a complete reversal, isn't it? It's not anything like it was. It's altogether different. It's a complete change in situation. Before, he just simply took what he needed from everybody else or took what he wanted, whether he needed it or not. And so he was able to get things from other people. Now he says, I want you to work with your hands, odd phrasing there, because it means you're actually doing some work so that you're able to give it away freely, able to share with other people as they have need. And so when you look at what the Bible talks about, in this passage, he's trying to say that, you know, there's been a change in the thief so that he no longer tries to steal, but he tries to share. And so the New Testament passages that talk about this are not talking about, you know, be careful not to steal. They're saying, I want you to work in order to have something to share. It's the same way they said, well, you know, I don't want you to kill. All right. You know, I didn't, they didn't die. We just, you know, caused a lot of violence to them. No. So I want you to love your enemies. I want you to treat your brother with respect. And so this one seems to be a difference in trust and a difference in honesty. It's not simply stop stealing. It's be able to give and be able to share. So why would anyone steal in the first place? What would be the reason for that? And it might be because they don't have anything, because they 
need something. Maybe it's about survival. Maybe it's something that's just basic. Um, the question becomes, how tightly do we hold on to things? Would you steal if you had to in order to survive? Would you steal food if you hadn't eaten for three weeks? You'd be pretty hungry after three weeks. And then there's a cupcake. You have to make it something you want, right? Well, you know, then it becomes a whole other question of, well, is it stealing or is it survival? We realize that when we look at the Old Testament that God had a way of dealing with all these things. So if you look back at Leviticus chapter 19, and starting in verse 9, he had a very different system than what we would see. Rather than the mine, mine, mine protecting everything, he said, when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edges. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages you hired, a work, the wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God. I am the Lord. And so as you look at this passage, this is an incredible way of, of dealing with things. Maybe one that, you know, is very innovative for us today. We don't seem to have this kind of system. And so if the farmer had a field, it all belonged to him. Everything in the field was his. But where did he get the crop from? Well, he planted the seed and then expected rain. We just got rain. Did it rain like that? Would that have flooded the whole thing? Would that have made his crop? But if it doesn't rain, you don't have any crop. And so it's kind of up to whether or not God blesses, whether or not there is rain. And they saw very much that God was in control of things like that. And they prayed to him about things like that. And he said, you know what? I want you to take all the crop of your field, except don't go all the way up to the edges. I want you to leave the corners. I want you to not have to get every single stalk in your vineyard, don't even bother with the grapes that fall. You know why they fall? They're too ripe. And, you know, they're beginning to be not so good. So you don't need those anyway. Don't go trying to pick those up. He says, leave those. Don't pick everything out of it. Leave for other people to come and get what they need. What an interesting way of doing things. How to be able to solve some of the world hunger. We are giving, we are sharing. It's not that they're coming to steal it from us. We're allowing if we're the farmer. If we're not the farmer, then we're the ones and we would ask permission. Can I pick the corners? Absolutely. I wasn't even going to go there. Because God told me he gave enough in the middle of the field where I'm not going to need the corners. And I can leave those corners for somebody else. And I can leave the extra for somebody else. And so it's not that I have to have every single crumb that I've ever gotten. It's because I'm going to leave some to be able to share with some other people. Because we realize God gave us the crop. Now the farmer doesn't pick it for them and bring it to them. You realize that also, okay? Okay. I mean, he leaves it in the field and they've got to come and they've going to ask and they're going to then go and pick it. And, and there's several stories that we see in the Bible that, that this is actually what they do. This was, was a very accepted way of doing it. And so they are allowed to come and to work and everybody gets along together. Not sure how to apply all this today when we start talking about honesty. So I'm just going to give you some situations and see how you come out with this, okay? But I think there needs to be an easy way to provide for people because not everybody owns land. 
Not everybody is the farmer. Not everybody's able to grow. Not everybody has all of the abundance. And so in this setting, you see God arranges for the poor. And he arranges for a way for them to come in or would us allowing them to come in that they would come in and they just rob us blind. I think it's after the harvest they come in and they're allowed to be part of it. So God arranged grace for the poor because he's giving grace. You see, stealing is when we demand what they aren't giving and what they didn't want to share and when we're not satisfied with what's left. And that might be more what stealing is. So, why do we steal? Because it's fun? Because it's exciting? Because we might get caught? Certainly that raises your blood pressure a little bit, I suppose. Something you can get away with. Why do you shoplift? One of the things that's huge, sometimes it's just to get away with it. Maybe we don't think we should pay for things. And there are some people like that, I guess, that think that, well, you know what? I need, and therefore, I don't have the money, so I'll just take it, and other people ought to know this. After all, don't you know about the corners? Wait a second. <laughs> I'm not sure if that applies or doesn't apply, so I told you I'm going to just give you some of these things. It might be that things have been taken away. It might be the thief came to your house and stole everything. And now you're the one who's in need. It might be that a fire came in and you're left with nothing. And so there are some things that you need. Does that mean steal? Well, no. We have a loss. It's not okay to demand from others, but it might be okay to ask. Is that stealing? If we find ourselves in a very difficult situation. What happens when we can't work because of health. Just not able to. Can't get around that well anymore. Well, is it the same as refusing to work? Is that the same thing? Or is it because I'm lazy and just didn't want to go to work? Or is it because, you know what, I work and I've got plenty of money, but I just didn't budget it right. I just spend it on everything else. After all, I don't have money for food because I had to have the new cell phone. You know, there's a foldable one coming out that's really cool looking from Samsung. 2,000 bucks. But I got to have the... Of course, I don't have enough to buy food, but, you know, I need a cell phone. Everybody needs internet before food, right? Well, or maybe it's a lack of maturity because... We just really think everybody ought to support us. Isn't that the way the world works? I mean, it was when I was a kid. I didn't have to do too much. My parents had dinner on the table. And so, therefore, you're supposed to give to me. And I'm supposed to take it. And it'll all be fine. Is that stealing? Maybe we just didn't grow up and didn't realize that, you know, we need to do things like that. So, we just set up a GoFundMe page and... Everybody will send us money, right? Isn't that the way it works? I have a need. Here's my address. Just send me money. Somewhere, uh, is it stealing? Well, people are giving it to you. Is it being honest? Is it fulfilling the principle God wanted of us providing? It isn't really stealing if they give it to you, is it? Unless we put ourselves in a position where they have to give it to us. But do they really have to give it to us? Like I said, I'm going to leave this with you. I'm not sure where to do it. Or maybe the biggest reason is, I didn't take the Dave Ramsey course that they offered at church, which, by the way, you can still sign up for, which will begin a week from Wednesday. Because if I'd taken that, I would have known how to do this. And I actually believe there's a lot of people in that situation. It's just that they don't know how to plan. They've never done it before. No one ever taught them before. And I say that because I was in that situation. 
I didn't know how to do all this stuff. Fortunately, there is a plan, there is a way to do it, and you should take advantage of that. There's a sign-up list at the Welcome Center. <clears throat> Sorry, brief commercial. <laughs> The point is, some of those things are just not being honest about you or about God. It's not paying your own way, but is it stealing? Technically, it kind of breaks the instruction about you providing for yourself and being able to work with your hands and having some to share. Or is that for only the people who started stealing in the beginning and the rest of us semi-honest people don't really have to do that, right? Mm, there's a lot of things that come into this. We do have ways of providing for people who can't work. Take advantage of those. There are some legitimate situations for asking. Absolutely ask. There are people who are willing to help. There are some people who are blank lame and blind and unable to work who have health concerns today. Certainly we understand that and realize that. We have benevolence. Paul is the one who's over that. Paul does a fantastic job with that. He's very good at that. But he's good with helping people realize where they are and how to get better themselves. Because that's really what the Bible talks about for us as Christians. And then there's all the other things that fall into this. If you, you know, download a movie for free because you wanted to keep it, you know, those tags at the end or at the beginning, you know, software piracy, and it's $250,000 if you copy this DVD. And, well, I just happen to have the software that allows me to, hmm. Or maybe we just steal somebody's idea. We would have thought of it eventually, and we just don't give them credit for it. That happens sometimes, or you take what doesn't belong to you. Stealing a human being is called kidnapping. Stealing property is stealing what others own, stealing ideas, stealing credit for something, stealing trust by lying, stealing a reputation by gossip, stealing dignity by humiliation, and all that stuff that comes to your office that your company pays for, you can just take that stuff home, right? It doesn't really matter. Because after all, you needed paper at home, and they've got paper at your office, so it doesn't matter. You can just take it home. Or the cups in our pantry or the paper plates. You would be amazed how many things disappear out of our own kitchen. And people think, well, it must belong to me. I'm part of the church. Really? Sorry. <laughs> And the one that I ran into, this was back in Miami. I came into the office one day and there's a kid at the copy machine. I think probably junior high age and he's just copying away. Just, and I'm like, okay, he's got a couple copies for a teacher maybe. And so he's running all these copies and I'm looking at this going, oh, I said, you know, what are you doing? Because it wasn't really secured or anything. It was in the office, but he was running. He says, well, I don't have enough money for a Bible, cause I'm, so I'm copying me one. <laughs> okay, it's 10 cents a page. I said, just take the Bible with you. <laughs> it would, but he saw no problem whatsoever with that. I'm just running copies. Copies are free, right? It would cost an incredible amount if you copied the whole thing and just, we'll give you the Bible, please. Somewhere we don't even think about stuff like this and we don't realize what honesty is and what it really means to be honest with all these things. It talks, Jesus talks about his situation and robbers sometimes. And in Matthew 21, Jesus goes into the temple. This is just after triumphal entry. It says, And Jesus entered the temple. He drove out all who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Interesting passage. Who was actually stealing in that passage. Well, 
No one called the cops. You see, what had happened is they had taken sacrifices to a whole new level, and if you're traveling in from somewhere else, you needed a lamb to be able to sacrifice, and so rather than bring one from home, or else you didn't have one from home, you could purchase one there. But like our economy, you know, when you buy it right outside the door or at the tourist gift shop, it's going to cost you a lot more, right? And we understand this. It's supply and demand. It's the way it works. Jesus calls it a den of robbers. Hmm. Really? We're just selling lambs. I know, but the exchange rate that you gave between the foreign currency and me today is not quite the same exchange rate as it would have been any other place or any other time. And the price of the lamb is a little bit higher than what it would have been in any other place at any other time. And after all, this is the lamb that you rejected from somebody else. So you got it for free and you're charging me extra. And was it stealing? I mean, everybody understood what was going on, and we all do understand how the system works. And I'm not sure it's honest. And especially when we're trying to do it in church, absolutely not. Do not have part of that. Do not be involved in it. It is not right for us to do. Don't take advantage of people who want to worship even if they are willing to pay the price you ask. Do not do that. There were no guns involved. They wanted the animal. But Jesus calls it a robber's den. It is not right to make a profit off of religion. I hope you never feel like that here. If you ever have a question about things like that here, please ask. Things are very, very open here. I know we mentioned the financial piece is 100 bucks. That's the price of the kit. Actually, I think it's much higher than that, and that's without tax and everything else, but we'll get it for you and not charge you the full amount, okay? Please don't ever think we are charging more or trying to ever make any money on that. And then Jackie got up and mentioned that, you know what, if you don't have the 100 bucks, Talk to us anyway. We'll see that you need the training, and there's a way to do that. This is not ever to be a place where money is misused. And sometimes people come and say, well, okay, I need money, and I just send them to Paul because I don't touch it. I have nothing to do with it. I have enough trouble with my own. I'm not touching the church money. Are you kidding? You want to talk about getting yourself in trouble, let's have church money. Wow, that's, get that away from me. That's never a good thing. And so when you see Jesus and the way Jesus deals with people, he talks about robbers a couple of times. One time is about a man who falls among robbers, and his point is about a good Samaritan who actually came and helped the man, that we should help people who fell among robbers, their victims. And then at the end of his life, there's a robber named Barabbas who's set free instead of him. There's a robber who is with him on the cross. At this time, the thief confesses him as son of God and that he has a kingdom and that he's coming in that kingdom in spite of everyone who's hurling abuse at him. At least he's honest about what he believes. And Jesus treats him with that respect. And I think sometimes it falls into different categories. Let me see if I can share this and see if this makes sense. Here's the way I see it should work. There are things that are mine and there are things that are not mine. Okay? This is honest. Some things are mine, some things are not mine. I cannot get the things that are not mine. It's very red and blue. Okay? That's just the way it is. That's it. Everything's clear, we should understand whatever is not mine, if I would take it, would be stealing, right? Okay, however, creative thinking here, maybe there's three categories. This one is correct, okay? 
But the distortion is maybe there's three categories. There's mine, there's yours, and there's the nobodies. Okay? Because after all, there are some things that belong to me that are mine, there are some things that belong to you, and there are some things that I'm not sure they belong to anybody. They're free. And if I take out of the nobodies, then we're okay, right? It's not stealing. So if something of yours is lost and falls into the nobody's category, and I happen to find it, well, it was yours, but you lost it, so now it's nobody's, so now I can pick it up and it's mine, right? Everybody with me so far? <laughs> and it follows that age-old law that we all know so well. Finders, keepers, losers. Yeah. Isn't that older than the Bible? <laughs> no, that's not honest. That's not being honest. And yet that's where we are a whole lot of times when we try to deal with things because this is where the gray area comes in. It's not really anybody's, is it? So, it's been a while, but uh, if you are out playing golf and there is a golf ball laying there and there is no one else around, is it yours? Nope, it's not mine. Can you take it? Well, it doesn't seem to be anybody's. So it falls into the nobody's category. And if it belongs to nobody, then it's okay to pick it up because it didn't belong to anybody because the only way you can steal it is if you take it from somebody. Can you take it from nobody and it's not stealing? I have a very weird way of looking at this, don't I? And the whole thing comes down to, is it a Pro V1 or is it a top flight? <laughs> if it's a top flight, just leave it there. Who cares? But if it's a Pro V1, this is a very legitimate argument. You know, you've got, those are expensive balls. And so if you find one of those and it's fine until the guy comes walking over the hill, says, have you seen my ball? Is uh, then what do you say? Yeah, I just picked it up. I was going to take it. See, we seem to think if we don't know who it belongs to, then it's ours. And I'm not going to tell you what to do in the situation, because I've done both. <laughs> Sorry, is that a confession? <laughs> Sometimes you pick it up because I'm running low. I've lost 14 balls already. I need... <laughs> I, I will leave it on the course, just not in the same place where it was, because I tend to lose them rather frequently. <laughs> yeah, what is honest there? If you find money, well, it's obviously in the nobody's category, right? Because it's not in anybody's hand. So if it belongs to nobody... It does get sticky, doesn't it? <laughs> does it go in your pocket or do you find somebody to give it to? Is it one of the things that you share? It becomes an end and means problem, doesn't it? It becomes a how honest are we? What are our ethics? What does it look like? Bottom line is don't take things that don't belong to you. They are mine or they are not mine and keep and maintain the things that do belong to you so that you're not in any need, so that need is not really the issue. Maybe it's a matter of want. Be honest in your story. That's one of the hardest things, isn't it? Not to exaggerate and make the story get bigger every time you tell it. <sighs> yeah, that one's a hard one. And above all else, be honest in your relationship with God. I think that's the most important one. Because God will catch you in every lie. He does know about every single one of that. Have you ever tried to steal from God? 
I mean, you can make excuses to me all day long, but you realize he really knows and really understands exactly what you're saying and exactly what happened, and he knows all about this, and you took this as a blessing, and you just used it on yourself. It wasn't to share. Are we honest about your living? Are you honest about your repentance? Can you steal heaven? It almost seems like some people want that. I want to just get in just enough. You know, I, if God just doesn't notice me, then maybe I'll be able to skate in, be able to get in there and, you know, kind of minimal effort, not do anything too much. And we don't realize Jesus already paid the full price. It's all paid for. He's the one that gave his life, a death on a cross. And you don't have to sneak in. And you don't have to be dishonest about all the things that you've done. You can confess every single one of them. Because there isn't anything that you've done that's ever going to keep you out. Or going to be something that God says, well, no, that one was too far. You see, absolute honesty is the best thing there because that's what's asked, that's what's demanded. There's no pretending we're better than what we are with Jesus hanging on a cross. Are you kidding me? He says, no, I'm already paying for all of this. Please make it worthwhile that you would be able to be honest with God about your own sin and admit who you are. And don't try and steal heaven. It starts with being honest with yourself. Honest about how much you're blessed. Or honest about how much you give God credit. And that's all, after all what we're doing here today. Because we came here to give God credit for what way in which he's blessed us. So that we're able to worship him as an expression of all of these things. And it's just an honest worship that says, God, I love you so much. I appreciate so much. And any sin I'm going to confess to you, God, and I'm not going to hold on to it. We don't have to pretend we didn't do it. We don't have to pretend we didn't get it. All we have to do is just give him praise and just open up ourselves to him. You don't have to steal from God. He's the one who knows it all. You're not going to over impress him. He's the one that offers you everything and offers you life. So today, if you're away from God and you don't have the grace and the blessing that you want from God, then by all means, make that right. Come forward, ask for forgiveness. Let's be blessed because of what God's able to give and because of the way he's able to give because Jesus died on a cross. Would you come while we stand and sing? What?